So before we get into the slightly more thorny issue of nighttime, I wondered if you could talk our viewers through the other big changes that have taken place in the Green Party's new defence policy. Well, we've got a very major focus in our defence policy on peace building, on putting dialogue and diplomacy and building trust um, ahead of moving towards conflict, which is what seems to always happen at the moment. Um, on the United Nations, we've said we think that it's high time to get rid of the permanent five members who dominate um, the activities of the United Nations, that there should be um, a Security Council in which all members of the UN take turns to take part and where issues are voted on with a two thirds majority. Um, and because it would be so difficult to dislodge the permanent five, we've said that in the meantime, when there is stalemate in the Security Council, then the General Assembly should automatically be able to vote on the issues and a two thirds majority should carry it. Um, the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, this is a 57 member state organisation, which includes Russia and the former Soviet republics, all of Europe, um, US and Canada. Um, and it's all about uh, building trust and cooperation and dialogue, looking at uh, arms control, uh, media freedoms, human rights, all the issues that are important to our security. And it has a pitiful budget of 140 million a year. So we would like to see lots more money and resources being put into the OSCE to build um, a better security infrastructure across Europe and beyond. Uh, we've got a section about human security. So that means looking at all the aspects uh, of security in our lives. Um, obviously, um, the global climate crisis and biodiversity crisis, um, looking at whether people's basic needs are met, uh, at human rights, at authoritarianism and lack of democracy, all the issues which diminish people's lives and cause conflict. Um, and inequality being one of the greatest of them, one of the greatest causes of, of conflict and war. Um, missile defence, that was a, um, a controversial issue. The ABM treaty was set up because Russia and America realised that having a defence against intercontinental anti-ballistic missiles, um, having a defence against them made it more likely that a nuclear, nuclear war might be fought with one side thinking that they could stop most of the retaliation. So they signed the treaty, but then some years later, the Americans decided they did want to keep developing their nuclear war fighting capabilities and they left the treaty. So we have Filingdales uh, and men with hill in Yorkshire, which are part of their uh, missile defense system. Um, we think that makes Britain a target and it does make nuclear war fighting more a more an idea that people believe could actually happen and could be survived. So we would scrap all anti-ballistic intercontinental missile defence um, in this country. Um, we talk about the need for conversion of military industries towards meeting social needs and above all um, needs for the, for the climate. Um, and we have a section about military emissions because at the moment, uh, all military emissions are generally not counted in countries' um, statistics when they're looking at how to decarbonize. So we would make sure that, that ours were totally transparent and accounted for, and we would really push in climate negotiations for that to be a mandatory part um, of what all countries have to, uh, to declare. Um, and then nuclear weapons, of course, Obviously the Green Party has always been opposed to nuclear weapons and we still are um, solidly, but because of the, um, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which came into force a couple of years ago, we can now frame it a little differently. Instead of just saying we would unilaterally disarm, we're saying Britain would immediately join that treaty, um, joining the majority of countries in the world who are saying that the possession and threat to use nuclear weapons is illegal under international law. And we would immediately start to dismantle our missiles and cancel all aspects of the Trident program, remove foreign nuclear weapons from British soil, um, not allow nuclear ships 
nuclear armed ships into the country. Um, so we would totally reject nuclear weapons and put massive effort into encouraging uh, discussions on disarmament. I mean, under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, all the nuclear powers committed 50 years ago to start to reduce their nuclear weapons and move towards total nuclear disarmament. They've reduced the weapons that they didn't need, um, but the US and Russia still have enough weapons to blow the world up several times over, and uh, they're modernizing them. And many people are not even aware that um, at the uh, US RAF base at Lakenheath, we either already have new American nuclear weapons or they'll be coming in shortly. It's all so secret that even CND can't find out whether they're there yet or not. Um, I don't think it's been discussed in Parliament. Most people are completely unaware. Um, and these are part of um, a NATO war fighting strategy. So you finished there with referring to a NATO war fighting strategy, which leads me on to what I wanted to pick up next, which is the area that's, uh, I guess, of the new party, of the party's new policy that's aroused the most interest um, is uh, the party's position on NATO. So I wonder if you could talk us through what your understanding is of the party's new position and also um, how that was was come to through the discussions within the policy working group. Yes, it, it was clearly the most uh, difficult area for us to discuss on, on most issues. We fairly quickly came to a consensus. But on NATO, we had some people who believe that NATO is a totally defensive organization that is virtually always a force for good. Some who were a bit more skeptical about NATO, but said because of the public attitude to NATO, because it's had so much publicity um, in recent months because of the, the war in Ukraine, it would be crazy for us to just say, we're gonna come out of NATO. Uh, and then there were some of us who believe that NATO is uh, an aggressive alliance that makes war much more likely uh, and that it would be much better for Britain to come out. So we came up with a policy which said that um, we understood that NATO uh, currently uh, supports countries when, uh, when they're attacked um, and they want somebody to come to their defence and they're part of this alliance. But that we would demand a number of changes in NATO policy. And if those don't happen, um, then we may look at alternatives. It's put as vaguely as that. Um, but the, the changes we're asking, are, first of all, no first use of nuclear weapons. And everyone's been so horrified that Putin suggested that Russia might use um, a tactical nuclear weapon. I mean, it is horrifying, but it has been NATO policy for decades to fight a conventional war until we're losing, and then to use battlefield nuclear weapons. And if that doesn't work, to escalate. And every time they war game, it ends up in a full-scale nuclear war. So it would be great if NATO would change its policy uh, to no first use of nuclear weapons, but that seems uh, pretty unlikely. Um, and then we're asking for it uh, to have um, respect for human rights, um, no out of area operations or exercises uh, to only act in defense of its member states. And we added two points uh, at the conference to respect all United Nations uh, resolutions and treaties. Um, and some people would say it already does and others would uh, question whether that's the case. Um, and finally, to have discussions with third party countries who feel their security will be affected when new members join NATO. That caused some heated discussion at conference, but we're not saying that there should be um, a veto. We're just saying that tensions and misunderstandings and miscalculations could possibly be avoided if there was more genuine discussion um, about security needs. Um, in advance of expanding NATO, because it, NATO has expanded so enormously since the Warsaw Pact dissolved, when many of us thought that ought to be the end of NATO, that would have been the time to turn the OSCE into a really genuine um, security framework for Europe, bring the Russians in and work with them. And that could have happened and things could have been very different. 
Um, so what this what this really means, um, I think different people are going to have different views on this. Uh, some of us think that it's vanishingly unlikely that NATO could or would ever make these sort of changes. So giving it um, a few years to see what happens, then um, a green government would be obliged to to leave NATO. Um, Others who feel more positive about NATO feel that these are just enhancements of its policy, which um, which genuinely might happen. Um, so, so you know, when all the headlines say Green Party has abandoned its opposition to NATO, we haven't really. I mean, we've said, but by by demanding all these changes, I think we're acknowledging that NATO is not just a defensive alliance, and it does. Um, it, it can be an extremely aggressive alliance. I mean, if you look at what happened in Afghanistan, and we're also distressed by what's happening to Ukraine. But when you look at what NATO, and we're partly responsible for this, did to Afghanistan, the country is in a far worse position now than it was before we started. So huge numbers of civilian deaths and the numbers of people in food insecurity have gone from a dreadful 62% to an appalling 92%. And kids under five are severely malnourished. It was 9% before the war, and now it's 50%. And the United States has put um, 36 billion into humanitarian aid for Afghanistan over those 20 years. But they've put more than 2 trillion uh, into fighting the war. So, um, so NATO, you know, most of us feel NATO is not really um, a force for good, and that if we if we were to have a green government, which of course would exist in a different sort of world from the one we have at the moment, by the time we got to a green government, many things would have changed. Um, it's very unlikely that we could feel that our values were compatible with being in NATO. I guess you've alluded to this already in in your previous response. Um, but obviously, the, the the new policy on NATO specifically talks about a series of reforms, and you've outlined some of those around uh, a commitment to a no first uh, use policy when it comes to nuclear weapons and so on. You, I think, have been quite uh, clear in your position uh, on this, which is you don't believe that these reforms, like NATO as an institution, uh, would would have to be so radically overhauled in terms of its raison d'etre, in terms of its approach, in terms of what it's set up to do and be, uh, in, if those reforms were instituted. Um, how realistic do you think it is that there is any prospect of getting the reforms the Green Party now wants to see to NATO? Well, at this moment in time, if we were able to start negotiating with NATO now, I'd say absolutely zero. Um, at the moment, um, NATO is really on the on the front foot. They're getting everybody to spend a lot more on weapons. Um, they're putting new nuclear weapons across Europe in Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Italy, Turkey, and here. Um, uh, guided bombs that are designed for um, nuclear war fighting. Um, so it's going in completely the opposite direction to the one that we're asking for. So right now, absolutely zero. But who knows whether things might change in the future? Um, I mean, at the moment, I think NATO's concerns about uh, the climate crisis would mostly centre around the fact that there are going to be parts of the world which are unlivable. So we're going to have far more refugees than we have now, desperate to find somewhere they can, they can exist because their countries have become too hot, too dry. And NATO's main concern, I suspect, will be how can we shore up our borders to keep them out? So I, I don't see how NATO can ever be part of the answer to the climate crisis. They want us to spend more on the military, which draws money away from the desperate need for tackling carbon emissions and reparations to countries that are already suffering so much. Um, if we look at human security, at, at all our security needs, um, it's not just about defending us uh, from a notional attack. It's about defending us from 
the, the ravages of the climate crisis, which obviously are going to uh, change the climate in many parts of the world, whatever we do now, and it's so urgent to take action. And we need to be putting our resources and our political will and, and our uh, technical skills into, into our security needs in terms of the climate and fighting pandemics, um, uh, preventing hunger and inequality, which is just increasing all the time and which is such a cause of uh, obviously death in itself, but a, a cause of conflict. Um, and NATO just, just isn't the answer to, to any of those things. So I think it's very unlikely, but you could probably get somebody else from the working group um, who would say, well, NATO is a defensive alliance, and I'm sure that after some discussions, it could move more in the direction of our demands. And I guess, I guess, isn't that, I guess, in my perspective, seeing the document and seeing how people have responded to the policy since it passed, I think your last comment there is a really interesting one because I've been I've spoken to lots of people over the last uh, week about this and it seems that the policy seems to mean all things to all people. So for someone like yourself who's very critical of NATO, uh, you can stand by and say, well, actually these reforms, NATO's never going to agree to them, so our position largely hasn't changed. We're still opposed to NATO because it's fundamental essence um, is opposed to our values. And then other people who have a more positive view of NATO can say, well, actually, uh, we're no longer opposed to NATO because um, we want to see it reformed and we've deleted that line which says we will take Britain out of NATO. Isn't that kind of a problem in terms of clear messaging and policy for the party? Well, I think some people thought that the clear message the Green Party wants to leave NATO would be damaging to us, um, uh, particularly at election time, because it's um, it's something the media would pick on all the time. Uh, just as Laura Kunzberg once said to Jeremy Corbyn, "You, because of your morals, you would leave our country defenceless. That is how the media would see we want to leave NATO as soon as possible. Um, Whereas if we are able to point out some of the problems with NATO, I think that will that will be quite an advantage because it almost never happens in the media. That there's a sort of blanket. NATO is here to defend us. Um, and and our politicians can still state that you know, if, if we can't achieve those changes, then we would uh, inevitably need to leave NATO. Um, Adrian Ramsey has already said um, on Sky News, I believe, our policy is still to leave NATO, which is perhaps slightly overstating it. But uh, I presume that he feels, as I do, that um, the demands we're making of NATO would be too great for it, unless, unless we can turn it into a completely different alliance, which, of course, would be wonderful. And so my last question for you is, at the end of the show, I'm going to be speaking to Lindsay German from the Stop the War Coalition, uh, who obviously have a very critical position on NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say to Lindsay to reassure her that the Green Party uh, still is a party of, uh, of peace and an anti-war uh, party? Well, if she, if she had a look through our policy, she would see that, you know, the whole policy is about um, reducing military spending. Um, I, I didn't mention the arms trade, massive control on the arms trade, of which Britain plays a horrible part in at the moment. Um, it's all about dialogue and cooperation and building trust. Um, and NATO really doesn't fit into that. So she might be a little bit disappointed that we're not just saying out of NATO right now. But um, she could look at the fact that our policy is a million miles away from the Labour Party, where Keir Starmer is telling his MPs and, and members, I think, you can't criticise NATO. Never mind discuss whether we ought to at some point come out of it. So anybody who wants to stop wars um, and is keen on, on promoting peace and justice, um, they can't do better than vote for support and join the Green Party.
needed. And I guess on that last point, it's worth reminding people that uh, although some of the, 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 the criticism I've seen of the Green Party's new policies have come from Labour Party members, uh, in 2019 and 2017, even under Jeremy Corbyn, Labour went into general election saying that they wanted to keep the nuclear, uh, Britain's nuclear deterrent and supported NATO as well. So um, I think <laughs> uh, kids in glass houses and all yes. of that. We, we can't blame Jeremy Corbyn for that. Obviously, he would have changed those policies, but he didn't have the power to do it. And under Keir Starmer... Yeah. The Labour Party is almost as aggressive, well, possibly as aggressive uh, in its military stance as the Tories. So people in Labour should not criticise Green Party policy. You should be extremely envious of it. And when you get to the point where you just can't take it anymore in the Labour Party or you get uh, suspended or expelled or exterminated or whatever the latest word is, then your home should be in the Green Party. What a wonderful point to end on, Linda. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Chris.